honor to talk to you today. Um, that was quite an introduction about Carla's um, amazing TV career and um, book author career, but you had a whole life before you even appeared on TV in 2008. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey that um, led you to food? Uh, well, thank you, Brenda. It's, it's really great to be here. Thank you all so much. I've been really excited to come here. Um, believe it or not, I was super shy, like painfully shy. I don't, I, you think I'm lying. Um, I was painfully shy. I, um, I went to see my first play in New York. It was Bubbling Brown Sugar in New York City. My uncle was in the play. I was 12 years old, and it changed my life. And, and I remember this one character, and I came home, and he, he was doing this song, and I don't remember the whole thing. And he would, Somebody would say something, and say, well, who wants to do such and such? Nobody. And I did that for a month. My mother would say, Carla, clean your room. Who wants to clean that room? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Who wants to take out the trash? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so, I mean, she, so she found out about this acting class at um, Luby Center, the YMCA in, in, um, D, in, where was I living? Nashville, child, I don't know. Nashville, and, um, and so I loved it. I absolutely loved theater, and then I started um, as, uh, doing theater at the, the um, Children's Theater in Nashville and doing small performances and everything, and it, I, I feel like it was a kind of, and I say it saved my life because I was that awkward kid, mm -hmm. and so when people said, oh, you're weird, I'm like, oh, thanks. You know, because it was like, you, it's, as theater, as a theater kid, it's like dare to be you, dare to be different. Right. And, so I, I sort of came out of my shell, mm -hmm. and I would just walk around and just, you know, walking like this and different characters. And then I wanted to do theater. I thought I was going to go to Boston University. They didn't accept me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they, they, they were going to put me in their um, school of uh, liberal arts. And oh. I'm like, I saw, and they have a great school of liberal arts. Right. I, I just saw it as rejection. I was like, oh. okay, no. Yeah. So I decided to go to Howard University where my sister was going and major in accounting, as one would do. That is a complete <laughs> opposite yeah. of That's theater. exactly right. I'm like, oh my God, rejection? I'm going to go over here. Um, so I majored in accounting. I graduated and got a job with Price Waterhouse. I went to Tampa, Florida, and mm -hmm. um, I was an auditor. Mm -hmm. No offense to any accountants out there. I love a good spreadsheet, um, still. But um, so, so then I was in the middle of, um, I, I was in the middle of a, a field of I-beam, not a field, but it was like I-beam and I was in an audit mm -hmm. and this accountant was lining up the edges of his paper. Uh. And it looked like, it, for me, it, took, it, it was like it took 10 minutes. It was probably 20 seconds, but I was like, I said, that can't be me. Did your whole life flash in front Yes. And you're like, oh. My whole life flashed yes. in front of me. And um, I quit two weeks later. I attended my resignation. I said, that can't be me at 40. I, I can't. And I, I, I was so afraid of hating my job at 40, mm -hmm. which basically propelled me to do other things. But I had met these girls. I was modeling. In, I started modeling at Howard University. Um, I started modeling in Tampa, Florida as a thing, a mm -hmm. way to meet people. And then I met these girls who were going to Paris, and I said, well, that sounds awesome. So I quit my job, as one would do. And, um, and then I had the number of a friend of a friend of a friend in Paris who was mm -hmm. modeling. I learned like 10 words of French, because I took a really quick class. Right. And then I went to Paris, as one would do, and um, that started that. And then that's where I fell in love with food. And how did you fall in love with food in Paris? Um, it, was, it was basically recreating the Sunday suppers that I didn't realize at the time. There was a woman named Elaine who was from Memphis, Tennessee, and she would have all the models come over on Sundays, and she would have this big dinner, mm -hmm. and they were cooking, and they were making macaroni and cheese one day, and one, one girl said, well, my mother makes it like this, and another girl was like, my mother makes it like this, and, and I was thinking, I have no idea. Your mother didn't make mac and cheese? My Sunday? grandmother did. Right. My mother made a bad version, but I still had no idea how it was made. Right. And, and I, I, was, I was never challenged mm -hmm. with that knowledge. And I didn't even realize that I wanted to know right. until then. Right. You were feeling homesick and you just wanted, That's you wanted right. something that comforts you. Yes. Right. 
Yes, and just being away and wanting all of those foods that I had at home. Mm -hmm. And I started buying cookbooks from the American Bookstore, and I started cooking for people to say thank you for letting me live on your couch. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the, the rest was kind of history, and I, and I kept doing that. And then I came back to the States, and I started a lunch delivery service as a fluke. I was the lunch lady. Um, hair salons, doctor's offices, barber shops, and... Um, I did that for five years until I went to culinary school at 30. So in, in a way, your business degree did help you a little bit in, yeah, in kind sort of, of um, framing your mind and not just cooking for friends, but making it an actual business. That's what I told my mother. You did not waste your money. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the opportunity to be on Top Chef come about? <laughs> um, so I didn't know about the show. Mm -hmm. You know how they play all of the seasons um, leading up to it, right? And I was at home, I was catering at the time, and my husband was like, oh, there's this new show, and I was flat out on the couch after a busy season, and it was season four. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the show, I'm like, oh, this is really cool, you know? And I said, like, oh, that's, that, that was it. Mm -hmm. A friend said, you should audition for Top Chef. I'm like, right. ah, I said, yeah, but you know, you say, yeah, right. you're not gonna do it. You know, we never do it. Um, so I walked into my kitchen one day and my sous chef said, I had a dream you were on Top Chef. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but she didn't know that I was talking to mm -hmm. another friend about it. I got home that day and I had a message saying, oh, this is so-and-so calling for magical L's for Top Chef. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought I was being punked. Right. Because what are the chances that that day, you know, somebody's talking about it, and then and here I, I am, do, right. right? So I wasn't going to call them back, because I was going to get the last laugh. But then it was on two phones. It was on my home phone, my cell phone. So I called them back, and they invited me to, to come up and um, audition. And I was like, OK. And it was either going to be in New York City or upstate New York. So I couldn't do the New York City when I went upstate. And I did this thing. and. I made a video and mm -hmm. everything, and, um, and then on the way back, um, my phone was losing juice, and I, I had a message, and I was on the train, and then I said, oh, let me check. No, I wasn't on the train yet. I said, let me check my messages, and it was like, oh, Carla, can you come back and have another interview? Now, I was 10 minutes from getting on the train to go back to D.C., mm. right? And I was like, ah! Okay, so I got in the car and I ran over, but everything about that interview with Top Chef was just like the universe saying, you have to be here. Right. You know, you have to be here and you have to be here. And I remember when they called me um, to tell me that um, I had been selected, I was in the kitchen of my um, catering company and they said, and this is big open kitchen, they said, are you alone? And I walked to a corner and I said, yes. <laughs> Uh, they said, you have been selected to be on Top Chef Season 5. I was like, oh my God. Um, and so um, then I, I basically had a month to get everything together. And then I told all of my workers that I was going to work in the Bahamas because I had been Oh, you can't in, tell anybody. No, they, there's like a million dollar mm -hmm. uh, like gagging plot. I didn't have a million dollars. Um, so uh, I was quiet. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was real quiet. So you went on the show, and mm -hmm. you were 44? 44. 44 at that time. I was 44. And you're looking it was 11 at, years ago. Do the math. <laughs> and you're looking at all these contestants, and I remember in your episode you had said that, you know, you're, you're the caterer, and yep. you're, you're surrounded by executive chefs. How did that make you feel? Small. Small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really felt like an other. I felt like um, I didn't really have that much respect. I mean, and, and leading up to it, I, was all, I always felt like I, was, I had this imposter syndrome. Right. Like, why am I here? You know, uh, you know, I know my clients like my food. And, and you know, you just, you just feel like they were doing stuff that was so amazing. Um, and then I remember saying to Arian Duarte, she was a really good friend, and I remember saying to her, you know, if you're on the top, you get feedback. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the bottom, you get feedback. And right. when you're in the middle, you don't get anything. Right. And, and then, so I had that moment. And then when I thought I was going to go home, mm -hmm. it was restaurant wars. And it was between me and Radhika. And that oven was a mess. And it, instead of vanilla, I ended up putting um, 
mint, mm -hmm. peppermint in my chocolate cakes. Mm -hmm. It was a hot mess, child. It was a really hot mess. Um, and it was between the two of us. Radhika was the head of the team. And my heart was beating. <laughs> my heart was beating so fast. And I remember thinking, I'm looking at Padma, and she's like this. And I'm, I'm just like trying to look over her head, and I, I'm like this, and I'm so nervous. And I remember thinking, nobody ever died at the judges' table. Right. <laughs> Why am I afraid? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst thing, honestly, that could happen to me mm -hmm. was that I just, you know, right. you know, died right here. And nobody's ever died. And I, I went like, I'm like, oh, nobody's ever died. And I was like, right. I mean, I literally shifted. And from that point on, mm -hmm. I, I started doing my food. Right. And it was so much better for me. Right. And how would you, because you're a classically trained chef. Yes. French techniques. And what do you mean by cooking your food? What does that mean? I think that I was doing the food that I thought I needed to do to win, food, right? that they were expecting. Right. And then I started doing food. So remember back when I was in Paris and I, and I was doing those Sunday suppers and I started thinking about my grandmother because I was homesick? Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to me, I started doing it here. Mm -hmm. So I was making food that I wanted to have to make me feel better about being there. Right. So I was doing, um, chick I mean, the chicken pot pie didn't come for until uh, All Stars, but, you know, soups and pies, and I was just making food that I wanted to eat. Right. And I would actually pack that food up and take it back to the house, because I'm like, oh, there's something left. I'm having something good to eat tonight. I don't know what this stuff is over here, like a meatball sub or something. I don't want that. But I started, like, packing up my food mm -hmm. and taking it home. So it really was stuff that I wanted to eat. I mean, right. there were some, some other little times where, you know, wasn't that good. But, um, but other people had not good, worse than mine, not good. And so they went home. <laughs> But you went, you went all the way to the finals in I that did. first season, then you were invited back for um, the All-Stars. Yes. And I, I feel like you're probably the epitome of you don't have to win to win. Right. And you, you kind of created a whole career after that. I did. I did. I did. It, it, was, it was kind of amazing. And, and my PR company, when I went back the second time, they called me like three times to come back. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. I, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, and they said, make it part of your business plan. The transition, what a lot of people don't realize, I mean, the transition as a caterer to go from Top Chef and being on this show that um, in season five, it really started to amp up and people knew about the show. My business sort of went from here to here. Mm -hmm. And it was hard. I didn't have the foundation or the, I didn't have just the, the infrastructure to take on that business. So mm -hmm. I had to find a partner who could help me. She wasn't the right partner, but um, I made a lot of quick decisions to take on that business. So it was very stressful. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I honestly felt, I said, oh my God, Top Chef has ruined my life. It's like the Oprah Winfrey effect. It, right. it, really, it really felt like it was ruining my life. Mm -hmm. And so when they had me, then they asked me to come back, I said, well, um, I, I just, I, it was, this was really hard. I don't want to cater anymore. I, I just can't. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, make it part of your business plan. Have a plan. Make mm -hmm. Top Chef part of the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went back and I said, okay, I'm going to go back and tell people I don't cater. I'm a recovering caterer. I don't want to <laughs> cater anymore. And so they were like, what do you want to do? And, and I said, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll just make cookies. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when I announced basically that I was just, I was making cookies. I'm right. not catering, I'm making cookies. And, and it was because of Top Chef. That's the only reason I went on, mm -hmm. to and, tell people I don't cater. And cookies let you in front of um, a wider audience on ABC. Yes. On the Chew. Yep, yep. And that lasted seven seasons? Seven seasons, 1,500 shows. Okay, so let me tell you how that happened. Mm -hmm. There's a story for everything. Emmy Award winning show. Yes, yes. The show uh, won an Emmy. The host won an Emmy. It was, it was amazing. It was the best job, honestly, I've ever had so far. Um, but so I won, I won fan favorite on mm -hmm. Top Chef All Stars. I had gone when I, before, right when Top Chef ended, I um, had a, a go see like a bunch of other people, hundreds of other people to audition for or to go to this casting excuse me, for this food talk show. Mm -hmm. And I went and I talked to them. Marcus was part of my, Marcus Samuelson was part of my group. And then that was over. I heard nothing, mm -hmm. right? Um, about a year went by. Mm -hmm. And now it's 2011. 
and I get another call saying that um, they're going to take off all my children. So they wanted to have people on this show that people knew. I had just won fan favorite, so all of a sudden I'm in their minds. And so they brought together a group of people, this time smaller groups, and I was there. Gail Simmons was there. Mm -hmm. There were some other people there. And then um, Mario had rushed in, and, and I had a meeting. I came back, and they were like, well, we just want the five of you together. And it was Mario, Michael, Clinton, Daphne, and myself. We were only together for a chemistry test for 20 minutes. Mm. Six days later, mm -hmm. they announced us as the cast. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. So you so, beat out Marcus Samuelson for the job. I kind of did. Kinda I didn't did. think about that. That's very impressive. Hey. Did you feel sort of a, a, not a burden, but a responsibility to represent the kind of food that you want people to know about? Well, we all came in um, for that show with a perspective, and mine was Southern food. Um, Mario's was Italian. Um, Michael's was Miss we Midwestern meat. Clinton was, uh, Clinton was doing uh, entertaining. He kind of got the catch-all because he was the moderator. Um, Daphne was a fresh face of health, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, so we all had our lane. But when I got that job, I was so scared. I was like, what does this mean? It happened so quickly right. that I'm like, oh, my God, what does this mean? I mean, ABC, I mean, what, daytime? I mean, you, you were going like, why me? Mm -hmm. Again, that imposter syndrome came back. And then my friend said to me, she said, it's your job to be authentic. And I was like, what does that even mean? Like, what, like, what does that right. mean in this, in this case? Um, and so the transition was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was really hard to go from, and people were saying, well, you, you've been on Top Chef, you've been on television, you love theater. Right. But this was very different because right. this was hosting. So just like you're hosting me, you have a time limit. Right. And you're hosting, you're doing a dish in five minutes, mm -hmm. not in two hours where they cut it down to five minutes. Right. And you're talking to the audience and connecting with the audience. And it, it, it's a three ring circus. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if people do it well, so Michael and, and Clinton, Michael and Mario had been doing this for years and they were so amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's freaking hard. Right. They make it look so easy and effortless. Like they, they're just, it's just effortless. And, and I was like, I was so uncomfortable. I thought I was gonna get fired. Mm -hmm. For the first three seasons, I thought I was gonna get fired. And being a, uh, a Taurus security and an ex-accountant right. balance sheet, I was like, I can't afford New York mm. without this job. Um, and so I, I lived in an apartment that was, um, that was furnished. And finally, after a year, I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to move into my own place. You're going to buy your own furniture. And it cost me $75. That's how little I had in that apartment. Um, but, but yeah, so it was, it, was a, it was a huge learning curve for me, and did, it was just scary every day. Did you ever get over that imposter syndrome? I did. Yeah? I, I, I did eventually. I, I saw a, um, a media trainer, mm -hmm. and she helped me just become comfortable with being myself. Right. And she said, I just want you to be the most comfortable you, the best version of yourself that you can be. Right. And she said, when you're looking at that camera... I want you to see your next boss. I said, okay. <laughs> and, I, and that made sense to me. Mm -hmm. that, that made sense to me. And I, and I you know, and st it was still, I still had some wobbles. Right. But, um, yeah. You had said um, early on in your career you didn't want to be known as the black chef. Yes. Um, what was, in your mind, what, what was that stereotype? And, and when did it become, being the black chef, become something that you're proud of? Um, so when I was a caterer and I was catering for um, Radio One, um, Kathy Hughes in DC, uh, I would do their meetings with, um, uh, like once a year I would go in and do these meetings for three weeks and they were expecting me to do fried chicken and, um, you know, like uh, if I did a meal, macaroni and cheese and collard greens and, and I was like, wait, I, I'm trained. I've been to French culinary school. Right. And, and I, I was like, I don't have to do that. And I remember going to school and coming back and telling my grandmother that I could fix her macaroni and cheese. <laughs> that didn't go over well. No, there was a spoon that just came out like, like, whoosh, <laughs> um, So I got that. Um, but, but I still felt like I've paid all this money to mm -hmm. learn these French techniques and, um, 
and so I want to use it. And then um, I remember doing one of those meetings and I decided to make fried chicken. Mm -hmm. And so people were like, well, what's for lunch today? Fried chicken, fried chicken. And then it was like telephone tag. Carla made fried chicken, Carla made fried chicken, Carla made fried chicken, whoa, Carla made fried chicken. I mean, it was just because I made it known. My right. name is Carla Hall, I am black, and I'm not giving you black food, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but it was just because I didn't want to be stereotyped. Right. Just like as a woman, you don't want to be stereotyped into saying you cook, you right. know. Um, so you have that boyfriend and your mom tells you to make the plate. I'm like, he has two hands, you know. So I don't want to make that plate either. But um, so it, it really was this thing. And then I think um, Top Chef really helped me see the value of that mm -hmm. and the value of my food and, and that I actually like this food and this is part of my culture. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's when I started to, to really embrace it. And then for my first cookbook, mm -hmm. yeah. Cook and and you sort of transition from Carla's comfort food to your most recent book, um, Carla Hall's Soul Food. Yes. Um, what, what kind of inspired that change and what is the difference? So I had a restaurant for a brief period of time and we called it Carla Hall Southern Kitchen. And um, when I became the culinary ambassador of the African American Museum, I learned so much about our culture and so much that I could be proud of. And, and it was like this, another switch that went off and I was like, yeah, collard greens. Yeah, sorghum and millet and phonio. Yeah, fried chicken. Um, and so when I did this second book, I said I wanted to do a cookbook under the premise if my ancestors came over today mm -hmm. from West Africa, how would they be eating here right. in the States? And because now you're seeing sorghum and millet and, and phonio and all of these grains that we didn't have access to even you know six, seven years ago. So I couldn't have done right. this book then. And now they're available and I wanted to show people this is part of our heritage. This is part of some this is part of the food that we should be proud of and we should know it. And the other thing I wanted to stress that there was a difference between celebration foods right. and everyday foods. You don't eat fried chicken every day. I could, but yes. I mean, yeah. all right. You know, one could. Um, <clears throat> but also, you need, back in the day, they right. needed their chickens for eggs. Right. So, you know, you would celebrate, you know, killing that chicken and frying it and, mm -hmm. and giving it to um, your family and friends who came over. So I really, I, I really thought about the food that I had with my grandmother growing up. Right. It wasn't always this soul food, this fatty soul food. My grandmother worked at a hospital, so we had a very light version mm -hmm. of soul food. And, and I do feel that, <clears throat> that you asked me the question, the difference between soul food and southern food, right. it's a very simple answer, mm -hmm. black cooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the difference between a hymn and a Negro spiritual. You got ha, ah, and you got ha, ah, 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 ah. I mean, I'm just saying. Right. I mean, that was a bad version of that, but <laughs> you get my, you get the gist. So I'm yeah. curious, because I heard that you didn't like cooking as a kid, and no. your parents or your grandparents parents didn't teach you how to cook. No. So did you have to track them down and go like, give me all your recipes? Or how did you, how did you come up with the recipes for your cookbook? I think because I love to eat, my food memories um, informed um, what I was making. So mm -hmm. I was trying to recreate and get to that thing. And that was the great thing about going to culinary school. So I had the experience mm -hmm. from just working without culinary school. And then when I went to culinary school, I got the theory. Mm -hmm. So it was using those techniques and building flavors to try to get at the food that I grew up with. And so I do have a couple of recipes from my grandmother, one of them being a five flavor pound cake, which I love. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, her buttermilk pie and some things like that, but I don't really have a lot of written recipes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's kind of like my grandmother. Um, she's like uh, she's from Singapore, so she'll say like aga aga, which is like an estimate, uh -huh. and she can't tell me her recipe because she's just cooking from memory. Yes, and um, we I try to recreate just by the taste as well, and just kind of adjusting it. And that and that food memory will kick in. I think that. You know, you taste something. There was one time when I was, um, I was doing the Paula Deen show. This was before, way before the Chew. And I was a guest on her show, and she was making, <clears throat> the show was about lemons. So she did some lemon macaroons, but she also made um, a lemon iced tea. Mm -hmm. 
and my grandmother made the best iced tea. So Paul is making this iced tea, and she has a lemon um, lemonade concentrate and some um, tea, uh, unsweetened tea, and she mixes them. And then right at the end, she puts in some almond extract. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's weird. OK. And I tasted it, and I was just like, Oh my God, oh my God, this is my grandmother's tea. We didn't know, we didn't know how to make it. We, it was always missing something. Wow. And right in that moment, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't breathe, I started to tear up. Mm -hmm. I was crying, of course you know they had the camera all in my face, <laughs> right? And, and it, was, it was that, you know, like little things like that, mm -hmm. right? And, and even the other day, I was talking to my godmother, and I hadn't spoken to her in years. And she used to make <clears throat> these chocolate chip cookies that informed the chocolate chip cookie that I made when I had my cookie business. And I said, Mrs. Pulley, remember those chocolate chip cookies? I loved those cookies. She, I said, did you put walnuts or something in them? She was like, no, I put a little rum extract. What? <laughs> Y'all go try it. I haven't tried it yet. I want to, but I haven't tried it. But, but you know, those little things mm -hmm. where you can't quite get to that food memory and something's missing and somebody will say something who's not even in your family necessarily. Right. Um, but that is just a beautiful thing. But I, 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 I suggest that people talk to their grandparents and their parents and, and get those recipes. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing called StoryCorps where you can talk mm -hmm. to them about that and, mm -hmm. and get their voices and, right. and talking about it. Because I know with um, black Americans, there was always a thing of, um, you know, they didn't want to share recipes. And the reason that they didn't want to share recipes is because historically, a black cook could not work in a particular place unless they shared their recipes with the owner. So there, th there was this distrust right. that happened, and rightfully so, right? So um, they didn't want to share them. And so there are some people who will go to a grave mm -hmm. without sharing their recipes, which means that that culture and that part of your family just sort of goes with, um, with this loved one. And, um, but, but I just encourage people to really get those recipes written down and try to cook with people. A, a really easy way that I did when I was doing my cookbook I would um, chop like onions and I would put half onion piles or a quarter of an onion in piles in, in paper. And then I would have salt and half teaspoons and, and just lined up and the oil and whatever spices I wanted to use. Because when I'm cooking, I don't want to say, how much was that? You know, right. my, um, the, the cookbook, the recipe tester would be behind me writing down what I naturally did. Mm -hmm. And so I would just dump and I would taste and I would dump. And so when I went back to try to figure it out, I just had to count the cups right. and the pieces of paper. Right. And so you don't miss the flow, so you're still in it. Mm -hmm. And so maybe with your grandmother, mm -hmm. if you did something like that, right. then you could capture those right. recipes. Um, I made her pour out whatever measurements on her hand and I took a picture of it. <laughs> step by step. Yes. Because um, we have kind of talked about the difference between comfort food or southern food and soul food, but soul food is more than southern food. Um, yes. In your work with the Smithsonian, you kind of learned that there's a lot of different regional soul That's food. Right. So um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about a difference between like a West Coast soul mm -hmm. food versus? So in the West, you may have um, like these meat stews. When the, um, a lot of the food that went out West was made from the cowboys. And these would be the, black, the blacks that would actually help the, um, the herdsmen. Mm -hmm. And so they would have um, these hearty stews and things like that. And, um, and then pumpkins, and then when you go up north, you would have more oysters, because we're landlocked right. in the southeast, we didn't have any of that, so you would have seafood and oysters and things like that. Um, and then you would have the influence, um, the people from the islands, like the hot pots mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then on the Creole coast, of course, you'd have the influence of the French right. and, and, and um, with the, the Gullah Geechee and, and all of those influences, so it, it was also very different. And I. I feel that in the, the Southeast, which I know more, mm -hmm. uh, the, that flavor for profile because I am from Nashville, um, it's more of a balance between um, spicy, vinegary, mm -hmm. and sweet, so that right. balance. And then, so when you, when you taste our barbecue sauce and our greens, they're a little tangy. And then when you go to North Carolina, South Carolina, mm -hmm. theirs tend to be a little sweeter. And people think, oh, 
you know, southern food is southern food, soul food is soul food, right. and it really depends on the influence. Like, for instance, cornbread. Mm -hmm. Why is it that cornbread, like in the south, you know, it's sacrilege to put sugar in our cornbread. But up north, they put sugar in it. So we put sugar on, they put sugar in. Mm. And it was because when the corn was grown in the south, we had a longer growing season, we didn't have to preserve it with sugar. Yes. Mm -hmm. So up north, shorter growing season, you have to preserve it, so the sugar was used to preserve it, so they were used to sweeter cornbread. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason for everything, you know, right. in, in these stories and, and why the food became, you know, what it became. Right, and for your cookbook, you traveled down south and you visited a lot of farmers and artisans. Um, is everything you know kind of learned from then, or like, I feel like it's, something we're so familiar with, yet we really know nothing of. That's right. It's, it's, um, that trip was incredible. We were in <clears throat> South Carolina, then Georgia, then we went to um, Alabama, Mississippi, and then we looped around back to Tennessee. And I went with um, my um, photographer, Gabriela Stabile, and um, my co-author, Genevieve Coe. And by going back with the intention of looking at the food in a way that I had never looked at it, because I was just living it. It's one thing to live it. You're just so busy living that you don't actually analyze it. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was that part of going back and talking to people and talking about what their mothers were eating when they were kids and all of that. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about my cookbook, when we got to Nashville, we were planning on downloading all of the things that we had, um, had sort of taken away and just cooking and recipe testing. But we had access to this really amazing kitchen with this beautiful sunlight. And so Gabriele, the photographer, was supposed to leave. And we all looked at each other and we were like, this is an amazing kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we looked at him and we were like, can you stay? And he was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we started going to, we went to um, like anthropology and Pottery Barn and borrowed some dishes. <laughs> and uh, then we um, went to farmer's markets and we just got some food and I started cooking and they were taking pictures. So the cover on my book mm -hmm. is just, I didn't have a makeup artist hair. I, didn't, I just had whatever clothes were in my bag. Mm -hmm. And um, we just, whatever I made, he shot. And then later on, I, I wrote the recipe instead of going the other way around. Mm -hmm. you know, the, and so all of the summer recipes, like the, the green beans and peaches and tomatoes mm -hmm. and watermelon and blackberries and melon, those were all the things that we got at the farmer's market. Right. Mm -hmm. So you did a lot of research for the book, but I read that you also did a DNA test to find yes. out what your heritage is. Mm -hmm. What did you find out? So um, I had the DNA test done through African ancestry, mm -hmm. and I found out that my ancestors on my mother's side are the Bubi people from Bioko Island mm -hmm. and the Yoruba people from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then on my dad's side, there are, uh, I forget the tribe, but from Ghana. And finding that out, right. um, and, I, and I was actually at the Nigerian embassy when I found out, it was so emotional. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't realize how emotional it was going to be because you don't feel adopted, but yet in that moment, you kind of do, right. right? And you're finding out this history right. that you don't have a connection to. And I haven't been to Nigeria yet, mm -hmm. but I do, I do want to go. Did knowing that kind of give you a little bit more context in the food that you grew up with, or is it more American for you? No, it's, it's still American because, I mean, you know, 400 years of slavery, mm -hmm. or at that time, 350, because, you know, I'm 55. <laughs> um, so it's still, but the, the thing that it did for me, um, how many of you all know hot water cornbread? Wow, I'm so impressed. Yes. Yeah. Any white people? <laughs> okay, there you are. Okay, yeah. Huh? Oh, oh, okay. You found out about it from my book. Great resource. Um, <laughs> so the, one, the reason I brought up the hot water cornbread is because I was talking to this girl from Nigeria. So when I found out um, about that connection, and I'm talking to them about fufu, which is cassava that is pounded into a paste and water is added, and that's what they use, you know, when they're eating the stew. Um, and so 
hot water cornbread was the answer to the Africans coming over and not having cassava because it was the South Americans who brought cassava here, right. but corn was here. Mm -hmm. And so they used corn instead of the cassava and they added the hot water to it, but then they had to cook it and then they cooked it in the pan, hence the mm -hmm. hot water cornbread. And, and when I was talking to her, I was just like, oh my gosh, because I didn't have those connections until right. you, know, you start to put all these pieces together. Right. And, and I think more than anything, I think what I hope um, that the book does, it's a couple things. One, I hope that um, people get inspired to look back in their culture and, and see what those stories are. But two, for African Americans to feel a sense of pride about our food and that there are two sides, that's a celebration and then they're the everyday foods. And also the opportunity to learn more about your history. Yes. And um, you know, the, the significance in, in Americans' culture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I heard uh, earlier this year you had the opportunity to interview our First Lady, uh, Michelle Obama. What was that experience yeah. like? Chow, that was so amazing. And can I tell you, this is the power of um, speak it and it will happen. I, I went to see her in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It was in December. And, I, and they had these people come up to the stage and saying, I am becoming and whatever that thing is. Mm. And uh, they had Alicia Keys and Felicia Rashad and Ina Garden and Rachel Ray and all these people coming. I'm like... I want to be up there. Why, why am I not up there? So I went to the after party, and I saw um, Art Smith. And I was like, Art, man, I want to be up there. So he, tell, he introduces me to the woman who makes this happen, mm -hmm. right? So I went home and looked up all the dates for all of the other shows. And the only date that I could um, make was March 16th. Mm -hmm. So I put that on my calendar in December. I said to my assistant, can you reach out to um, the Obama team and see, um, I don't know how, don't, I'm not even acting like I knew who they were. <laughs> I, I, I just said, find out. I, I'm not, I'm not, we don't roll like that. Okay. Um, you know, if you can reach out to them and see um, if I can be one of those people. So two weeks out, mm -hmm. I'm like, Kirsten, did you, did you reach out? She's like, oh, shoot, I forgot. <laughs> so she comes, she says, okay, I'm going to call right now. So she calls. An hour later, I get this text, and um, it's Carla. No, she didn't, it didn't say my name. Would you like to be the moderator slash interviewer for Michelle in Cleveland on March 16th, which was the date that was on my calendar from December. And it was, my name wasn't on it, so mm -hmm. I was like, this may not be for me, but I'm gonna say absolutely, Carla, <laughs> just in case, and I'm gonna let you work it out if you have to put your foot in your mouth, okay? And then uh, I said to Kirsten, I said, I said call out and call and make sure that it, they really meant it to be for me. And so I think it was better that I only had two weeks because mm -hmm. I would have freaked the heck out. Right. And um, so um, I read the book. I got my questions together. They don't give you anything. It's mm -hmm. all on you. Mm -hmm. And then um, I got there and when we were going out, she had her little bottle of water and she had a little water like this and I had mine. I was like, oh, I'm drinking with Michelle Obama. <laughs> and, uh, and so she said, she looked at me and said, silly, but the, whatever her face did, I still had water in my mouth. And I went, <laughs> sprayed the, 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 the ex first lady. I was like, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. She's like, girl, get out there. <laughs> um, so that broke the ice. And uh, it was so much fun. Oh, I bet. And, um, you know, she, I think she might be the first first lady to really talk about health and nutrition. And she had this amazing garden. Yes. Um, and it kind of reminded me of um, your, your work with the Helen Keller International. Yes, yes. And, I do a lot of work with Helen Keller. And part of their program is homesteading, like teaching people how to grow their own food. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, your involvement with them? I'm on the board. Um, the reason that I chose Helen Keller in New York, um, I wanted to be involved with an organization that checked a lot of boxes for me. Eyeglasses check. Mm -hmm. um, 
Africa, Asia, check. I mean, primarily Africa. And food and empowerment of women, check, check. And so we, I went to Vietnam. I went on a, a trip to Vietnam. And it was all about teaching these people how to farm and teaching them mm -hmm. um, how to empower themselves and, and how to feed their children from zero to 24 months. And, and the women who had started this, they were so into it and, and just creating um, businesses. And it, it was just... It, it was really wonderful, and feeling the empowerment to hold down the fort and the finances of the home. Right. You know, which was which was really incredible. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I think we're gonna open up to some questions in the audience. Hi, Carla. Um, Hi. Have you considered yourself a leader in terms of the field that you're working in? And if not, what was it that it took for you to start considering yourself as a leader? You know, it's so funny. I think um, I do. I do now. And um, it took being on cooking shows and hearing from people in in my life, like coming up to me and saying, because of you letting your hair go gray, or because of the food that you make on television, or because you, um, the way that you judge on a show that is um, empowering and constructive for the contestants. And I realized that I have a voice that I can actually use, and for women, and, and, and to be authentic. And I think the thing for me, mainly, is to be my quirky, silly self or whatever that, whatever that means and to show people that you don't have to be a particular way in a particular box to be on television and it speaks volumes to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, it's time to go home. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, do you uh, like experiment, I guess, within like the kitchen and stuff and like kind of what does that look like and like how often do you allow yourself to like fail before you succeed? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <that's laughs> I fail all the time. Um, so, I wish I could say, especially when I was catering or when I was, uh, when I do an event like for food and wine, for the, for the food and wine that I have a tried and true recipe. Most times I do not. I'm like, ooh, I want to try this. Okay, I have to cook this for 1,500 people. Yay. Um, so, because that's the big motivator because you can't fail. In my, in my private life, I tend to, um, to play and when I'm doing a cookbook, I tend to play, um, the other day, this wasn't even for a cookbook, so my, my thing now is a smoker bag. Have any of you all used those smoker bags? Um, right, right. So it, it's on Amazon, it's a smoker bag. You can get like mesquite, hickory, alderwood, and it's a foil bag with perforate, perforations on the bottom, and you can put whatever in it. And right now, I, I've been putting, uh, I, I've been trying to experiment with having a a grilled hamburger, but in the wintertime, y'all don't have to worry about that. And I, I, and I, ha, I have failed. It, it, it's been really bad. And so I took the smoker bag and put some sweet potatoes in it, and now I'm all about smoking in the smoker bag. And it is amazing. And the next thing is gonna be celery root, because I think that's the next it item, the vegetable. And um, so I do play a little bit. I play more with, with spices and flavors than a technique because the technique is the technique, and I, I put flavors and stuff on. But when I fail, if I'm doing a cooking class, and, and I, I tell people, you want me to fail because I'm gonna, I'm gonna know how to correct it, and, well, or not, or I'm gonna say, okay, you, know, you need to throw that away. So, uh, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I, I love failing. Failure is the best lesson of all. You, you, kinda, you, you want to recover and move through failure to get to the other side. I like failing, like the Dyson, you know, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. 
You, you are obviously a wonderful, accomplished, independent woman. Where does your husband fit in all this? Girl, see, this is what happens when it's an older person asking the questions. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, y'all know what's been pulled. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I mean, it's all important. Um, so I'm glad you asked about Matthew. Um, Matthew, um, and the, the first, all of the two for seven seasons, um, I, we live in D.C., and the show tapes in New York. And even before I accepted the job, I said to Matthew, what do you think? And I was prepared to not take it because I didn't want to jeopardize my marriage for work. I mean, because that wouldn't bode well. So he said, I think it's a great opportunity. And so we worked it out. Um, it, it was, it was kind of tough in the beginning because I would go to D.C. And he's like, that doesn't stay there. That doesn't live there. That, and I'm like, oh, my God. And he would come to New York. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't go there. You know? So we each had our domains, and we try to work that out. And... Um, but we plan time together. I think the, what, I have, what I've learned is being curious about each other's day and really asking those questions and, and really coming back to what are you doing and, you know, and, and, how, and not just how are you, like questions that aren't a, a yes or no or short answer and being curious. Um, the, a year ago, Matthew left his job at the FDA. He was an attorney. And for... for he basically supported me living in New York because it wasn't a lot of money and, and, and I still had my business and everything and, and he was working and, and because of his job, you know, um, I stayed afloat. And then once things had leveled out, uh, I said, like, it's your turn. And so I was like, what do you want to do? And he said, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, you know, just think about, think about what you want to do. And he had been doing the yoga thing. He got me involved in yoga. And then he decided to do his yoga teacher training primarily for himself. And he decided to teach. And so a week before the chew ended, he quit his job. Uh, I said, it doesn't change anything. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it was the best decision that he could have done. And so now he teaches yoga and he, te he does uh, workshops and he does privates and he does yin yoga and restorative and um, sleep yoga nidra. And it honestly is the best thing for our marriage because he has his thing that he loves and he's passionate about and I have mine. And so we get to honestly ask those questions and I know that he loves it and the way that his, his little face lights up when he talks about it and you know, it's, it's just awesome. Um, thank you for asking about him, yeah. Okay, there's one here and one here. And one there. Here first. Hi. Uh, we met years ago at the, the uh, Taste of L.A., or Taste L.A. Uh, you were just introducing the Chew, and you left a wonderful first impression. You were very kind to my mom. And that being said, uh, first impressions and how they relate to the students, what could you tell them about putting their authentic self uh, you know, forward? <coughs> if they're going for a big interview or following their dreams outside of school, what could you, what could you uh, say about I, that? I think that, and it's great to see you. I can't, you see you're like a little dark dot back there, but... Great to hear you. Um, I, I think that when you're going for an interview and you are meeting somebody, the, the, the one way that I keep it fresh when I'm meeting people, I think you've gotten to know me. Now, this, in this moment, in this, in this time, and presently, I want to get to know you, and that's what keeps it fresh for me. I, I think that um, otherwise it gets old. It's like, oh, the 10th person. No, this is another person. This is a different person, and so... Um, that, that's how I do it. I think that when you're going for an interview and it's about your authentic self, um, they're, you're interviewing that company as well. You're interviewing them and they're interviewing you. A lot of times people go in with a lack mentality, like I have to have this job and if I don't have this job, and you give so much power to the company that you're not yourself and they couldn't see themselves being with you because, but you really want them to see you. And, um, and I think that's, that's the biggest thing. And not to be um, fake, but find the thing. And we were taking pictures today um, when I had a group of students. And, um, and somebody was saying, oh, you know, you have all of these poses and everything. I, when I'm taking pictures, I have a story going on in my head. 
you may not hear it. I'm like, hey, Granny, what you doing up there in heaven? Hey, girl, what's up? You know, and I'm making up this story, but nobody knows it. But I, I know it. And so it comes through whatever it takes for me to be genuinely and authentically happy in that moment. You know, that's what I do. Um, so there's, hi, I'm over here. <laughs> uh, it seems like there's a really big sentiment in the culinary industry that like everyone that goes into it fails or the statistic that like, whatever, 90% of like restaurants don't break even. Do you have any advice for people that are maybe discouraged or overwhelmed by that sentiment? I think that when you want to do something, instead of visualizing it being successful, you should also visualize the hard times. It will be hard. It, um, I, I had a restaurant, I had it for a year, and people say, well, I had, I've had interviews, and like, so tell me about when your restaurant failed. Um, and I'm like, I learned so much, and I would do it again the same way if I could take away that lesson, because I know that the lesson doesn't stop there. And I think that um, sometimes young people are so afraid to fail that, it, that they don't even try. My six-word novel is Say Yes, so, so that's saying yes to this thing. Adventure follows. Okay, I had the restaurant. Then growth, it failed. But that growth is going to take me, I'm still going to use all of this knowledge to do something else. I don't think you should not do it because it's hard and it may fail. Um, if you are that 10%, great. But you're still going to have all of these other challenges. It, it was an amazing experience. I, I just think you shouldn't think about that, but you should try to prepare yourself as much as possible for the challenges that you hear about. Oh. I'm saying hello from Nashville. I'm from Nashville. I just yeah. wanted to let you know you have a sister in the house Yay, sister all girl. the way from Nashville. But I also wanted to ask you about the Nashville hot chicken yes. that is so big. I grew up in Nashville, and I don't remember any hot chicken. So I just want to know if you did. And secondly, do you have a favorite Southern entree that you love to uh, always bring out when you have someone like Michelle Obama for a right? your house guests? <laughs> um, so where did you live? I lived right downtown North Nashville, grew up right around Fish University and Meharry Medical College and all of that. Okay, so, so I was born in Meharry. My grandmother worked at Meharry. My mother worked at Vandy, then Meharry. Okay. And I went to St. Vincent, which was down there. Yes, you know, I know exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. um, but my mother had friends over in East Nashville where the hot chicken place was. And it was actually somewhere on Charlotte before it went there. And so we, we had gotten it. We, we had, but it was a cult, it was like a cult following for Prince's Hot Chicken, right? Um, but that was the only game in town for the longest time. And then, you know, it started to um, spread. spread. Right. Um, but my favorite dish, when I have friends coming over and they're from the north or something, you know what I, I like making for them, with, for them? Chicken and dumplings. Yeah, I love me some chicken and dumplings. And I, you know, I talk about making biscuits with strangers, but I'll do the biscuit dough, make it light. I'll put lemon zest and herbs, and then drop the biscuits, the like the on top of the, the broth, and put the top on. You're yes, girl. You are like yes, yes. <laughs> um, and it's so satisfying and really brothy, not too thick. Mm. <laughs> but at Thanksgiving, cornbread dressing all day long. Mm -hmm, that's what's up. Mm -hmm. Did we have somebody over here? Um, what does an average day look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> today I got up at 8.30. So let me tell you about the day today. So today I got up at 8.30. I had shot a show called um, Outrageous Feast. I had to do voiceovers for that show for about two hours and then I was in traffic, I went to my agency to talk to, about, talk to somebody about doing a podcast, and then I was in two hours and I came here. Um, but before that, I was in Nashville for three days doing the, um, doing the uh, Music City Food and Wine. So there's no average day, my point, you know. Uh, and then in the meantime, when I'm on the plane, I'm working on my next book, so I'm writing out all these notes for that. And, and then I had to do a lot of interview questions. And then I also, when I was in Nashville, because I want to be an actress still, I squeezed in some time to do this um, 
um, sketch that this girl is doing this online um, series on Instagram. So I was doing that. And what else? And I made biscuits with a country music star. So, I mean, I have no regular schedule, but I just try to pack everything in. If I die tomorrow, I did it, y'all. Don't be sad. I did it. You know? <laughs> Thank you, thank you.